the now the session is called Education for Human Security, uh, and uh, we have been joined by Monif uh, Zubi and Mariona Cardona Valles. Uh, these are the this is the lineup for the continuation of our discussion. Uh, and I will start now with Monif, uh, because Monif is uh, a fellow and uh, as, uh, as Fabi and, and Chantaline, uh, but he's also a member of our board of the World Academy. Uh, let me tell you a few things about Monif, uh, not exhaustive, but just a few lines from his bio. Uh, he, is, he was actually the director general of the Islamic World Academy of Science from 98 to 2019. Now, as I said, he's a trustee of the World Academy. He has been an advocate of science and technology for development for over 30 years. Monif has written extensively on science and technology issues, uh, science education and sustainable development, uh, as well as on water issues from the Middle Eastern perspective. Uh, and he gives lectures on topics uh, such as technology and, and science in different, uh, different universities, Canada and United States. Uh, apart from his work-related interest, he has a keen interest in history and politics. So from all this, Monif, your humanistic experience, this is what counts for us, your humanistic approach. Uh, could you continue uh, the discussion, I'm sure you can, uh, around the role of uh, education for human security? How do you see things evolving? Um, the situation is fairly bleak, I would say, but uh, what we heard also from colleagues is that there are a few openings uh, so what is your interpretation of the state of play, Monique? Thank you very much, uh, Donato. Well, uh, I have, I've written down a number of ideas that I wanted to share with the panelists and the uh, attendees. Um, essentially, I, I say that when we talk of security, we talk of four world wars that the world has witnessed over the last 100 years. There was the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War, and last but certainly not least, the global war on COVID-19. In the first three occurrences, we have seen evidence of how hard military security was compromised and eventually destroyed. What followed in the case of the Second World War, in Europe at least, was an ascendance of soft security clearly manifested by the Marshall Plan. Now, in 2002, the United Nations World Summit on Sustainable Development, uh, the former Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, outlined five critical areas that have profound effect on the way humans live, on our human security. And the term we have, securities, covering water, energy, health, agriculture, and biodiversity came into existence, encapsulating the areas where action was needed. I would add that uh, what has been discussed in the previous session, essentially the culture of peace as another objective of our effort to bridge this divide between education and security, especially in the company of somebody like Donato, was vice president. Now, since 2000, we have realized that the Millennium Development Goals, or the so-called MDGs, which seem like ancient history these days, and we have water, energy, health, agriculture, and biodiversity, uh, including goals related to water security, energy security, and food security, require a multi-level approach to achieve them, not the extreme fragmentation that characterizes the present silo-based disciplinary structure of governance, including higher education. 
the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, alluded to, alluded to by the previous speaker, was adopted by the United Nations in 2015. The agenda forms the new global development framework anchored around the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, covering economic, social development, and environmental protection. Now, the fourth world war that we've been living through for the last two years almost, the COVID-19 pandemic, has proven to all that we human beings are one. We are all set to face numerous challenges in our post-COVID-19 world, a challenge that renders all our military might helpless in the face of the virus. The 13,000 or so nuclear warheads that the world possesses were totally useless when it came to the fight against that insignificant virus. The call by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in March 2020 for an immediate ceasefire in all world conflict zones and for opening up the windows of diplomacy and dialogue in order to bring hope to the most vulnerable human beings facing COVID-19 went unheeded. Also, perhaps in the hope that the UN would again assume its collective role as the guardian of international peace and security, whilst the world fought the deadly COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Guterres advocated that the world must turn to science and solidarity, not least to combat the spreading of the global misinfodemic. So our political leaders need to be educated, not only our school children, not only our university students, but our political and societal leaders need to be educated on sustainable development, on combating health issues at the global level. Uh, as we have witnessed how political leaders only paid lip service to science-based advice and pushed their countries to the brink of catastrophe. In all cases, after initially disregarding the assertions and data provided by science advisors and educators, they, that is the political leaders, rather belatedly changed course. Thus here again, educating the leaders would have to be a priority. To manage the socio-political and socio-economic fallout on our post-COVID-19 world, we should focus on empowerment through education as a foundation of national and international security. Our post-COVID-19 world will witness extraordinary tumult and, and polities struggling to maintain social order. Upholding security while generally adopting good governance practices. Realizing long-term soft security in most countries can only be achieved by assuring sustainable and equitable socioeconomic development. Regional insecurity is heightened in the absence of dialogue. Dialogue that has to again become the norm in the face of existential threats regionally and globally. Human development has drawn on the need to focus on enhancing human freedom and capability in general. Not surprisingly, it has given a central role to education as a critically important component of human development. The Human Development Index, developed by Mahbub al haq decades ago, many years ago, gives a major place to literacy and schooling as being central to the expansion of human capability and as part and parcel of the aggregate indicators of human de development. Human security is integrally connected with securing human cap capability and thus applies directly to the contribution of education in enhancing human development. The bottom line is that 
human security stands on the shoulders of human development, on education. Lastly, Donato, I will say that the spirit of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has to prevail again in our post-COVID-19 world. Revisiting the agenda is necessary to factor in new health and globalization and education parameters, as well as elements that have come to undermine the foundations of contemporary society with its rampant inequality and rising injustice, and which threatens the very survival of our species. With that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Dear Moni, thank you very much for your brilliant expose, for linking all the parameters, all the issues together, the interdependencies that we know are so essential, and for reminding us that human security, as you said, rests on the shoulders of developmental issues such as education. Uh, so I'm sure there is a lot of food for thoughts from the words of Monif uh, to continue this discussion. Uh, and next to speak, I have the privilege of introducing Mariona Cardona Valles, uh, who is uh, a, a new feature for the World Academy. Uh, and uh, I recently met her at the University of Barcelona. Uh, she is a lecturer uh, at the Open University of Catalonia uh, and uh, specialized in international law uh, and international relations. In fact, she is the coordinator of the um, postgraduate course uh, on uh, peace building and crisis management at the University, Open University of Barcelona. Um, she deals with uh, fragmented uh, international uh, uh, standards and international law. So I think that this is where we could start the discussion from, Mariona, with you, the fragmentation of international law, uh, how that comes in uh, into these uh, um, overall picture of uh, fragmentation, as we said, as challenges that we have for human security. How do you see that uh, uh, you know, benchmark? Uh, can, can that be of, of a help uh, to, uh, to restructure the foundations of a better educational system? Or do we have a problem there as well? And by the way, since we are talking about human security, I know that you have touched upon in your research on issues of uh, right to protect, for instance, and, uh, uh, and the um, collusion, let's say, between the two theoretical uh, fields, you know, one, one hand, human security and right to protect. Maybe you can uh, give us also um, uh, some hints around your findings in uh, this particular discipline. Over to you, Mariona. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donato. Um, I will try to keep it short so we have enough time for the rest of the speakers. So the first question that you posed is about fragmentation. I think that uh, in terms of understanding the connections between human security and international law, it is very important to understand that the limits that we can predicate from international law itself because of fragmentation are also applicable or challenges in order to implement a human security. And I believe that this is very important to tackle in terms of how do we teach human security? Because in order for our students and maybe future leaders to understand and grasp the complexities of implementing human security, they need first to understand the impacts that the limitations of international law, multilateralism and international law enforcement have on human security. And allow me to show you these limitations through some examples. So the first problem, which is extremely connected to fragmentation, is the problem that some regulatory developments are relying on false narratives of human security and human rights protection in order to justify other agendas that are sometimes hidden agendas. And this relates to the concept of epistemic communities and the fragmentation of, of of our expertise in international law. This is exemplified by the Kimberley process and conflict diamonds. 
So after a major international backlash, uh, the states who constituted the main producers and importance of, importers sorry, of diamonds concluded this Kimberley process uh, system, where, which is a binding agreement under which they could only trade diamonds among themselves, and only as long as they were certified as not conflict diamonds. And when they established these uh, trade restrictions and the system, they relied on a human security narrative uh, to substantiate this regulation, because in fact, the preamble of the Kimberley process appeals to the devastating impacts of conflicts fooled by the trading conflict diamonds on the peace, safety, and security of people. And also, it appeals to the systematic and gross human rights violations that derived from these conflicts fooled by these diamonds. However, when it comes to describing what were non-tradable conflict diamonds, that is the definition of a conflict diamond, it merely stated that a conflict diamond would be a rough diamond used by rebel movements or their allies, only by them, in order to finance conflicts aimed at undermining legitimate governments. That is, in order to be prohibited to trade with, in order to be a conflict diamond, it needed to be uh, traded or exploited by a rebel movement with the objective of financing a conflict that aimed specifically to undermine the government. And this definition clearly shows a plain disconnection with the aforementioned human security concerns that were described as the rationale be behind this regulation. And this had real impacts because in fact, in 2008, in a process of governmental monopolization of diamond mines, uh, Zimbabwe's, the Zimbabwean um, governmental security forces shot and killed 200 artisanal miners and were widely accused of indiscriminate violence towards local populations, including killings, beatings, or widespread rape and forced labor in order to scare the population away from the mines. So Zimbabwe was never suspended as a member of the Kimberley process and the diamonds were not considered untradeable conflict diamonds because the fact that the government itself was exhorting great amounts of violence to obtain, to obtain these stones was a non-issue for the Kimberley process. In fact, the chairman of the Kimberley process expressed that this organization was not a human rights organization, hence departing totally from a human security or human rights narrative. But what is the outtake of this? It is that both human security and human, and human rights discourses can be instrumentalized to justify non-aligned agendas. And this is something that we need to be really careful about. And in terms of fragmentation, the, the Kimberley process was an absolute su success for those individuals who are working or are pertaining to the epistemic community of state security. It was a success. However, it was felt and perceived, and I think we can all agree, as, a fa as a, an absolute failure from the perspective of human security. To make things even more acute, in 2013, I think, there was, a, the, there was a proposal that circulated to amend the definition of conflict minerals in order to align them much more with the human security approach. Um, this was voted and was rejected. So from, from until today, this is still the official definition of what is a conflict diamond that is non-tradable. Moving on to the second problem I, I wish to present is, this problem is the inadequacy of international law to cover the preventive nature of human security. Because international law does not provide us with tools to demand from states such a preventive approach. Take for instance, the case of the crisis uh, at the border of Poland with Belarus and the refusal of Poland to grant access to international aid agencies to the, to the area, to the forest, and its response to potential refugees. So first of all, Poland has ratified the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the, right, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And this alone obliged Poland to protect the rights of individuals under its territory or jurisdiction. But also Poland has ratified the 1951 Refugee Convention and the provision of non refoulement is customer international law that binds all states, regardless of ratification. So technically, Poland cannot prevent anyone from requesting asylum uh, or other forms of international protection of human rights at its border. 
and needs to consider the requests individually uh, in accordance with the person's needs for protection, especially when children are involved. However, does international law provide us with a preventive or interim measure to ensure that these potential refugees are allowed to request these statues at the border? No. International law only grants us a response to consummated violations of human rights or refugee rights, simply because it's embedded in the nature of international law to be activated subsidiarily and only in the event of a state's failure to comply with international obligations. So in other words, when the international community is witnessing the first red flags of a future state failure to provide protection amidst an incoming crisis, we lack mechanisms to oblige the state to comply with its obligations under uh, in human rights law. Uh, and not until these human rights violations have occurred do we have tools. By then, the human security threat has materialized and there's no prevention. And in this point, I want to make something very clear, which is that states, it's not an illegal intervention for states to uh, make use of all diplomatic tools to aid other states in protecting human rights. In fact, it's an obligation to make this availability accessible under the Articles 55 and 56 of the UN uh, Charter. And what is more, under the responsibility to protect of the Security Council, it is the, even demandable from the Security Council that it will not only adopt uh, Chapter 6 uh, measures when we are facing a fully blown crisis, but also from a, pers from a preventive point of view. However, once again, we find the, the third problem, which is humans, uh, the Security Council being um, a political organ instead of a legal one. And this draws us to the third problem that I wanted to point out, which is the politics beyond the law. So let us compare two cases to understand this. First of all, um, after the Taliban returned to power in Afghanistan, as Monira pointed out, uh, there has been what some have called a gender apartheid. So Afghanistan had ratified the Convention on the Elim Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and this is still applicable and the Taliban government is still bound by this convention. This is the first case. Then we have another case. We have all seen episodes of the US administration separating foreign minors from their parents at the US border under the pretext that the adults may be traffickers with no individualized assessment of the case. And the US refuses to ratify the Convention on the Right of the Child. So what do these two cases have in common? These two situations have in common that in abstract, they constitute breaches of international law. But the difference between the two cases is that in the case of the US, we cannot consider the US as having breached the rights of the child because the right of the child is not customary international law, not yet, and the US is not bound by the treaty. So what is the first outtake out of this comparison? First, that in order to guarantee human security, it is essential that we tackle the enormous elephant in the room, that is the fear or reticence of states to bind themselves to international treaties, leaving us with the only alternative of proving the existence and further working on creating customary international law. But secondly, the second outtake is that the case of Afghanistan is a testimony to another major problem when it comes to guaranteeing human security. The lack of enforcement of certain areas of international law, um, sorry, specifically those that are not connected to uh, economic objectives. I am speaking of the lack of enforcement of human rights and refugee law compared to other economic areas. And this is based on the fact that we lack a will of states, first, to bring claims against violating states, or in the case of lack of a forum, to adopt countermeasures on the basis of international responsibility for wrongful acts. And second, we also lack a will to construct two enforcement mechanisms or forums for these non-economic regimes. So does this mean, to conclude, does this mean that human security is toothless? No, by no means. It merely means that it is our task to make our human security students, future leaders, future politicians, diplomats. They need to be aware of the different and collateral pieces that we need to work on readjusting 
in order to move towards a better human security approach. Thank you very much. Mariona, thank you very much. I'm so pleased that you could join us because you gave us a perspective from international law that probably we are lacking. We're lacking in, because we didn't have the opportunity to investigate all the issues that you did. What I retain uh, in, in few words, I uh, think we should retain is obviously you spotted areas of double standards, let's put it like that, in international law uh, and uh, the need for enforcement of uh, measures that are beyond the economic uh, measures uh, that could somehow advance uh, human security through education as well. Uh, so along these lines, I think maybe we can have some reactions or responses, especially colleagues such as Chantaline, who is dealing with uh, these kind of subjects, but the same goes for Monif. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I hope that we still have Phoebe online. Um, so could I ask uh, Chantaline to, to add to that? Uh, the, the main point for me is uh, readjusting. This is a word that also Ma Mariona used, readjusting the concept of human security in terms of the deliverables, in terms of the practices, uh, and uh, uh, more than the uh, standards. You know, the standards are, are very relevant. Of course, they're there. But if they're not applied, what can we do to apply them? And what can we do to promote justice, to promote uh, a system, educational system as well, that make uh, leaders realize that if we do not have uh, an approach that is valid everywhere, you know, we will incur into these double standards no matter what. I mean, if we are uh, so afraid of uh, domestic jurisdictions uh, invasions, uh, or, 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 but uh, we should be afraid as well of the fact that there are inequalities, there are issues that are not, uh, you know, not, not dealt with uh, in our internal uh, domestic uh, jurisdictions. So up to, to you, Chantaline first, and Monif afterward, and, uh, and the others. Thank you, Donato. I'm not sure I can add much to what um, uh, Mariana uh, uh, brilliantly presented, except to say, and I'm not an expert in uh, in the diamond industry, but except to say that, and I should learn a lot from you, Mariana, but um, except to say a few things. One is um, there are ongoing um, negotiation at the WTO to reform the trade system um, because we need a reform of the multilateralism, including the trade system. We don't even have such a thing for investment. So at least with the trade system, we have some rules to protect the small players. For the uh, investment, there's no such rule because there's nobody that actually look at uh, the rules for uh, investment. In terms of, except for in the regional and bilateral uh, agreements, of course, of investment. Um, and um, of course, we all know that it's pretty ironic that the WTO uh, ministerial session that was supposed to be held last week had been, has been canceled again because of COVID-19. And one of the things he was supposed to look at is exactly this idea of, of um, uh, waivers on the TRIP agreement so that we can actually have equitable access to, the, to the, the vaccine and developing countries can actually start producing their own vaccine and therefore have the coverage that we need so the economy can pick up and we all can invest. But also to look at um, several proposals in terms of making the trade regime more aligned with the SDGs and human rights and that has been postponed again. So it's pretty ironic in my book. Um, and, and why is it that in a time where everything is done and we had COP26 that was in person but ISO hybrid and we have all these hybrid conferences including WAS conference, why is it that we could have an hybrid conference um, so we could actually advance on these extremely important issues? It's, it's, it's um, And of course, you know, we all said COP26 was the most unequal conference we ever had because developing countries could not be at the table. Having a voice at the table, of course, is important, um, but there are means to do that. UNCTAD 15 was held in an hybrid format. We actually had, we, we worked with UNDP and our original, uh, our uh, development corporation offices in, uh, in, our, in um, 14 least developed countries. We beefed up their um, digital connectivity and flew regional uh, um, the, um, ministers from these regions to that spot so they could actually interact amongst themselves and contribute to UNCTAD 15. They're always to do it that you can actually 
um, have the voice of the most vulnerable at the table. So the system instead, what we're gonna have is the G20 is gonna go ahead and uh, the more inclusive uh, multilateral processes uh, at the WTO and the UN that don't. Now, um, I also think it's it's important what, what I think both, uh, well, the three, <laughs> I think all of us have said, Mariona, Monif, and, and I, but uh, I think Phobia as well, is, is the political economy of these things. We teach students, oh, here's the, here's the, so, the economic cost-effective solution, second best solution. But we basically don't teach our future leaders or even ourselves two things. One is, how do you address the resistance of the stakeholders, such as what Mariona was talking about, signing these treaties? What are the pressure points? How do you get, um, how do you rally um, uh, enough stakeholders to put pressure, to nudge, to 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 partner with civil society organization that might put pressure on these stakeholders? Uh, we don't learn that. We don't teach that, um, and we don't teach collaboration. We don't teach co-creation. Um, and so I think we're not helping ourselves uh, in, in that case. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, Donato, and I, I hope it, it's providing some uh, beginning of an answer. You, you certainly did. Uh, thank you, Chantaline. Uh, and uh, I think it's up to Monif practically to conclude the, the session because we have a few minutes to go. But before giving you the floor, uh, Monif, I want to read a question from Aisata Diakite, who writes to us, uh, the following. I'm very confused about human security issue because I don't understand where we really are, where we are really are and, and where we are safe. Is it because the country is developed uh, free from war or quality education really means that people of the country, I mean, are safe? Means th th doesn't mean that education can contribute to make people safe. Um, I, I think uh, this confusion, uh, Isata, in reality is, is an analysis, it's not uh, in, in, you know, a confusion, it's a question. We have this question in, uh, in the top of our minds, uh, don't we, Monif? Well, uh, yes, Donato, it's, uh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, I, I, I actually saw it on the chat and uh, I, I had to go back to the textbook definition of human security which I'm looking at right now, actually. There are so many definitions, uh, but I, I like this one as being the protecting the fundamental freedoms, uh, the essence of life, the means of protecting people from uh, se severe and widespread threats and situations, uh, and that human security integrates three freedoms, freedom from fear, freedom, from want and freedom from indignity. As I said, that, that would be <clears throat> the textbook definition. To me, it's the whole ecosystem. We talk of sustainable development. We talk of um, uh, the 17 sustainable development goals. I think human security is essentially uh, a personal, uh, local, national and global ecosystems, whereby the freedom of the individual to exist safely and securely is a priority for governance and for other human beings. In my uh, uh, intervention, I focused on security being hard security as understood by military leaders and politicians in terms of arms and nuclear warheads and tanks and guns and uh, fighter aircraft, and which is important, but to my mind, probably not as important as soft security in the form of uh, water security in water poor countries health security, as in the case these days with the COVID-19 and the vaccine uh, availability to, in certain countries and lack of uh, availability in other countries in terms of agriculture and food security. And we've seen how our world 
just about coped with the food security value um, delivery chains or supply chains uh, at the height of the pandemic. It's about contributing to a more peaceful world. It's about um, resource, uh, 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 resources, natural resources, security, and so on and so forth. So I think historically, even in, in the year uh, 6 BC and BC, I, I'm not going back 2022 years, by BC I mean before COVID, when the Sustainable uh, Development Agenda was adopted in 2015, uh, our priorities were not. Now, I think COVID has shown us that we really need to redefine our priorities to look at security afresh in terms of uh, soft security, because with all the massive investments in hard security, we are we discovered all of a sudden that all that has not really been useful in stopping this tiny, minute virus at bay and, and, and not allowing it to cause havoc <clears throat> all over the world. So um, I think with the sustainable development agenda, we have a foundation <clears throat> and that we need to revisit the sustainable development agenda taking on board the lessons that we've learned from the COVID-19 crisis and um, implement strategies whereby science-based decision-making really influences policy because uh, it's our lords and masters, the politicians, the societal leaders that take the decisions. And sometimes if their decisions are not science-based, or evidence-based, that can lead to real disasters that affect not only their nationals or their countries, but may have global consequences, particularly as we've been talking about climate change with the aftermath of the COP26 um, conference in Glasgow a few weeks ago. Uh, I want to say this is the perfect way of concluding our session today. Thank you, Monif. Uh, thank you all, uh, Fabi, uh, Chantaline, Mariona, for being with us. Uh, each and everyone has contributed with uh, the, the different perspectives, but I think coming to the same conclusion somehow, you know, that we, we have to foster peace and security and human security through education. I mean, education has uh, an enormous uh, value added uh, that, and something that we can collectively play uh, with, you know, we can, can use this enormous resource that education is. Uh, education that integrates people, that, building, that builds bridges uh, among civilizations, that uh, opens minds and hearts of people.